Let me know if you can give me the back. So, so we'll yeah, on. Uh, I can see that works. Yeah. Maybe that's better? Yeah? Okay. But you can just, for Hannah, just raise up your hand if you can hear me. Okay. So, um, so my name is Rajesh Naran. Uh, I'm the Department of Direction of Computer Engineering. Uh, my contact info is on the website. You can take a look at there if, if you want to know more about the research. Um, so today I'm going to talk about an idea for a scalable nano pattern. And by scalable, I mean uh, how do you make nanostructures over areas that are reasonably large? For people who do nanofabrication, uh, areas that are large are typically the order of microns. So some of you probably recognize that because it takes a long time to fabricate structures over areas, reasonable areas. Um, I wanted to make nanostructures over much larger areas. Maybe, maybe meters. Okay, this is a little bit uh, optimistic. But let's see. Uh, let me start with an example from nature. So that's a lotus leaf. Um, it has some very interesting mechanical properties, uh, material properties as well. It is uh, a self-cleaning surface. Uh, it's, it, it water drops on it. Water is easily repelled. And the reason it is self-cleaning is because it has nano it has, uh, nanostructures. Um, so you can see water, it's one of the droplets, and it rolls off, and so on and so forth. So you can clearly see uh, this sort of surfaces could be quite important uh, for practice. For instance, you can imagine having self-cleaning surfaces uh, for lighting or solar panels or whatever, which can be cleaned by themselves, which is kind of nice. And all kinds of other things. Of course, uh, drawing inspiration from nature, we can do a little bit better. We can make uh, omniphobic surfaces. So these are obviously the artificial structures, um, the nanostructures, and they can repel both water and oil. In this case, they have been, uh, the water and oil have been uh, colored with some dyes you can see uh, apart. Okay? So we can do better. We can learn from nature and probably do better than what is available. So the, the, the take home message, if you take home one message from this book talk, is that here that uh, if you can control the geometric information at the nanoscale, okay, that's why I refer to the geometric information content, then you can derive interesting functionalities, uh, material functionalities, obviously device functionalities, for those of you who design uh, circuits and so on, you know that it's the geometry of the uh, metal contacts and vias and uh, transistor geometries that determine all the properties, like how fast you can switch your and so on. So all of it sort of uh, summarized in this very basic thing. Okay. So again, if you think about it, uh, what um, some of us are interested in doing is, can we control the nanoscale geometry, but hopefully apply this control over larger areas so we can have microscopic effects? And I'll talk about a couple of different applications of these. Now, if you recall, what I showed you before were all very simple periodic geometry. So they were pivot or something like that, if you remember, from the uh, omniphobic surfaces. Obviously, we can do better than that. Uh, I just took one example of a uh, pattern which was probably done about 30, 40 years ago now by uh, Newman uh, with uh, Professor Fabian Pease at Stanford, which is essentially uh, the first page of the tale of two cities, uh, which was written in a six micron and six micron area. This is kind of a seminal achievement because this was the first time. Uh, this, by the way, won the Feynman Challenge, the Feynman Prize, where Feynman, uh, in his famous lecture, um, offered a prize for whoever can write a certain amount of information in a very small area. This is a very famous lecture that Richard Feynman did. Uh, but in any case, what I wanted to convey was that, of course, we can do things much more complicated than just regular structure. We can make words, whatever. Right? So the question is, uh, what clever things can we do with this? But the perhaps more pertinent question that I would like to ask today is, how do you take structures such as this and scale it up to large areas? So for instance, if one went and imagine making complex nanostructures covering the scale of this lotus leaf, uh, is that even feasible today? Uh, the short answer is no, it's not, because it's much too slow. Uh, it would take about no more than a year to 
pattern, you know, depending on the structures and the details and the tools and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a fairly formidable challenge. Um, and clearly a new paradigm is probably required to do this sort of kind of manufacturing, where you want to have enough structures to scale with a large array. So that's sort of the, uh, the challenge that uh, I want to talk about here. The paradigm that I, I am interested in pursuing, and I think it shows the most promise, is uh, the following. It's based on a combination of fast replication, which I'll come to in a minute, and fast patterns. Now, the replication is actually a very old technology. It's based on uh, the technology which is uh, used today, for instance, for newspaper printing. It's basically called roll to roll printing. Okay, so you have a master, essentially, which looks like that, a roller, and you have a film in a, in a roll, and it rolls. Okay, so you're basically doing printing patterns. Obviously, these patterns are not the same as the newspaper. They will be at the nanoscale. So you would have what's called that you imprint the part of it. And uh, there is a very, very clear trend in uh, uh, nanofabrication, um, uh, people who study nanofabrication, towards in, in this direction um, for performing nanofabrication. Clearly, the advantage is very obvious. It's, uh, it can be very fast, right? Uh, it's just like a newspaper. Uh, if it's fast, that means it can be cheap because you can make things fast, you can make large volumes, of it, and uh, costs can be amortized in a lot of volumes. Um, so there is a big promise offered by this technology. Of course, the, the key challenge for implementing a technology such as this is the master itself. So one, this is, of course, the replication process, right? You have a master you're replicating over and over and over again. But the master itself needs to be made, and that's a very slow process. That's what I want to focus on a little bit here. Uh, not what I refer to as fast pattern, so it's a pattern generation as opposed to pattern replication. Okay. So I'm going to make a few uh, general statements before the proceeding. <clears throat> First, I'm going to make a statement that patterning with light can be much faster and more advantageous than with other particles. And the reason I make this statement is uh, just to give you some background. Uh, people who do nanofabrication typically use what I call scanning electron beam photography systems, which is essentially a beam of electrons, much like you see in the cathode ray tubes, uh, but focused with much more complicated optics to a very, very small spot. Of course, why, one, why would one use electrons? Uh, the reason is because electrons are very, very small and drop the electrons. They can be focused in a very small spot. So you can make small structures. Or there are other uh, charged particles that we use, like helium ions, and neon ions, and so on and so forth. So, but the, the, the fundamental premise that I want to start with is the fact that optics is better. And the reason is that you can have high flux in photons. And of course, high flux is uh, easily available in lasers. Right? My laser pointer here is, is clear evidence that you can get very, very high flux in photons, and it's very cheap, relatively cheap, as opposed to getting high flux with charged particles. Uh, what that means is that you can write things fast. You can do parallel patterns and so on and so forth. And I won't dwell much on that, but if you're interested, I can talk more about it later on. Uh, another important uh, distinction between photons and charged particles really is that you don't have charge in the So when you have an electron beam, and then that reaches the substrate, the substrate has some charge on it, you have electrostatic deflections. Which means that if you have random charges in your substrate, you can have random fluctuations in the electron beam, which of course is problematic because that means your pattern will have random errors of it. And that's uh, very problematic, especially if you're doing that for comics. Yeah. So you can get very high accuracy in principle with photons. Okay. So that's my premise I'm going to start with. Of course, photons have a big disadvantage, and that's diffraction. If you take a beam of light and focus it down with the lens, shown here, just a green laser in this case. If you look at the focal spot, it's broader, it's not a point. And that has to do with the refraction. If you look at it in a bit more detail, this is sort of what it would look like, the distance that you can uh, focus the light down to in this direction is about a third of the wavelength. Okay? So for green light, such as this, this is about 532 nanometers or 500 nanometers. A third of the wavelength is a little more than 100 nanometers. Okay? Our goal is to be able to go down to, say, 10 nanometers. We want to make metal structures, which are roughly 10 to 15 nanometers. It's about an order of magnitude smaller than what can be achieved with this 
conventional approaches. Okay. Of course, in the axial direction, you have a bigger spread, and this has to do with the physics of uh, uh, focus of light, so we won't dwell on it too much. So, one, uh, I'll talk about two different approaches to go smaller than what can be achieved in this uh, conventional way. And the first approach is actually very simple. If you can imagine a refraction limited spot, which is that big spot I showed you before, obviously it's stylized over here. If you can erase the outside portion of it with a ring, and end up with such a small spot in the center. Okay. If you can do that, clearly you have broken the refraction limit. You have created a spot that is smaller than can be achieved in conventional methods. Okay. And this is the approach that I'm going to talk about uh, in, in the first place. How do you do this? Um, it's actually not that difficult. It's based on uh, materials which are referred to as photoswitchable materials, or photochromic material. These are materials that exist in two forms. They are, they are either opaque, highly absorbent, or transparent. Okay? And some of you probably have seen this in uh, transition uh, sunglasses. So lenses which you walk outside and become opaque, you come inside and become transparent. Exactly the same kind of materials. Obviously, we engineer them to do different things, but same kind of stuff. So, uh, the set they exist either as an opaque form or a transparent form, and they can be switched by light. So in this example, in the opaque form, which I call A, absorbs a photon at lambda 1, it becomes transparent, and it forms, it, 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 uh, forms uh, state B. And when the state B absorbs a photon at lambda 2, it returns back to its original state A. So fairly straightforward. Now, if you take this material and form a, a fibro, uh, for a switchable material, and illuminate it with both these wavelengths of light. Okay, in this case, we have a big refraction of the spot in the blue, this one, and a big refraction of the green in the red. And they are simultaneously illuminating the material. Now, of course, you can see that the blue spot will for force the material to become transparent everywhere. Right? But the green shaped spot will force the material to become opaque. Everywhere except in the center, right? So in the center, the material will remain transparent, but in the edges, it will remain okay. In other words, I have achieved my subtraction. I have achieved this minus that, essentially, by passing the light through the material which is and I can achieve something small. That's simple as that. It's a very, very simple concept. Now, uh, to look at it in a bit more detail, what we do essentially is we take that material and put it right on top of photoresist. Photoresist is just material that you use to record uh, the nanoscale pattern that you want to create. And you can see I have my uh, ring shaped uh, red light and uh, normal focus spot in blue. Okay. Uh, I'm just showing you a cross section of this space, and you can imagine that the light will leak through the central region, which will be transparent and expose the photoresist. Okay, just like I just mentioned. Now, again, from a very far two perspective, you can imagine if you simply take the intensity of light in the red and increase it with respect to that in the blue, you can confine that region that remained in the transparent form to a very, very small red area. Okay? In other words, what happens if you do that, if you increase the intensity of red with respect to the blue, is you can decrease the size of the spot that comes through to this photoswitchable material and exposes the resistance. So that's how you now have an additional knob to get smaller and smaller patterns. Okay, and then, uh, you can increase the intensity of the red with respect to the red. Which turns out to be an interesting optical nonlinearity for those of you who study nonlinear optics. Again, I won't dwell much on that. And this work, we've shown some preliminary results. Uh, in this particular example, uh, what we did was we uh, illuminated this material with uh, two standing waves. So essentially two standing waves in the red, one in the red, one in the blue. The, the period of the standing wave in the red was twice that of the blue. So you can see that the nodes of the red coincide with the peaks of the blue every, at every other node, right, as you expect. And you will see the light leaking out from the nodes and exposing the resistance. And you can get very, very small. In this particular case, the waves were about 30 nanometers, and the wavelength we were using was about 10 times larger, no more than 10 times, 325 nanometers. 
So that shows the, the proof of content. Okay. There's some more details which I will skip, skip over. The other interesting thing, of course, one can do with this. Yeah, go ahead. So those are the magnitudes of the modulation there. Like how fast? Yeah, yeah, that's a very important point, actually. Uh, skip through it a little bit. Uh, of course, here, uh, so the question is how fast is, do these transitions take place? Now, the individual molecular transitions are very fast. They are in the order of, um, uh, it depends on the details of the molecule.